province. Going to Mesopotamia, we have this very interesting religious tradition called the Mandaeans. The Mandaeans, who now today mainly live in Iraq and Iran, uh, appear to have also lived there for the past couple of thousand years. Uh, unfortunately, because of the war and uh, the problems with Saddam Hussein, the marshes were dried up in southern Iraq. Uh, and uh, in his campaign against the Shiites, what happened is also the Mandaeans got a bit of this uh, trouble and they had, had to move. The problem with Mandaeans is they really can't move very much because their ceremonies mainly revolves around evolution, sort of going through water and get, becoming cleansed in Mesopotamia. And so that makes it very difficult to move anywhere else. Here is a typical Mandaean ceremony of baptism, you might want to call it. Uh, here is a nice text giving us detailed information in Mandaean of what to do uh, to go through the ceremony. So that their baptism uh, ritual cleansing is central to them, and they live mainly today in southwestern Iran and Iraq. And some have come to the US, of course. But that would be a difficult task for ritual. Uh, where we find interesting ideas about Judaism, Zoroastrianism, and Christianity combined together. Uh, recent, more recently, scholars believe that this was an ancient Jewish sect uh, that survived in Mesopotamia and in true time has been influenced by others, and as such, uh, they still have remained tenaciously, at least for the past 2,000 years, or, and perhaps more, in Mesopotamia. But the religion in the third century, for about 500 years, that probably was more popular than all of these religions, or perhaps on a period, they, they were as popular with these other religions as Manichaeism. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't hear about Manichaeans very much, because that religion died out in the 14th century. Uh, the, uh, the Turks were the last group who gravitated towards Manichaeism in the 14th century. We hear about them no more. But when they start in the 3rd century, they are the best new religion on the block. And it's not only Mesopotamia where their prophet, Mani, <coughs> is born in the 3rd century, but all the way to China. But if you looked in Egypt, you would find Manichaeans. And if you went to Europe, you would find Manichaeans. This is the international religion of the third century. We're told that Mani was from this Parthian nobility that we already talked about, Parthia, and was born in Mesopotamia. His parents were wealthy, noble families who also were interested in dabbling in religions, attaching themselves to these ascetic groups, finding the reality. They were, you know, just like a new age religion, trying to see what is the truth. So they would attach themselves to one group, Patik, uh, Mani's father, for example, we're told he had renounced eating me uh, meat, wine, and abstaining from sex later on when he attached himself to one group. Mani, is, we're told, that attached himself to a group in Arabic and Aramaic known as the Muqtasila, those who like to become sort of ritual, uh, ritual cleansing through water. Uh, so there was all sorts of ideas taking place in Mesopotamia. And there are, by the way, Zoroastrians there, Christians there, and of course, Jews there, uh, along the Mandaeans, and then Mani is growing up in such an environment. And here's a nice later image of Mani in, in, in Syriac. Chodadal would know how to read the, that Syriac text. Uh, what Mani tells us is, at least Mani Canaan texts tell us, that uh, he received a message from his double. Now, you might think of it as a angel coming to him and say, you are the prophet. Again, we find these scenarios throughout history again and again, when an angel or your double comes and tells you, you are a prophet, and you're not accepting it at the beginning. You find that in the Islamic tradition as well with the, the prophet Muhammad. And he's convinced that he is a prophet, finally. And his outlook and ideas are fascinating. One wonders, once you go through his ideas, why would anybody want to be a mannequin? Well, maybe not. Let me try to convert you to Manichaeism, I can, in the 21st century. I'll act out in about two minutes, as, or three minutes, as a Manichaean teacher. Well, I would say to you that people, you are made up of soul and flesh. I think all of you can get, have an idea that uh, if you feel yourself, you are made of flesh, and you have a soul. But what is important is that your soul has been entrapped in your body. That is, flesh is evil while your soul are made up like particles. 
and they've been entrapped from the beginning of time when uh, the evil forces attacked the heavens and God. What I want to tell you is to how to free your soul from your flesh and become one with God. A very mystical idea, a very, if you know the Islamic tradition, again, very Sufi-like tradition of becoming one with God. In, in the Islamic uh, tradition, it's wahdat al-wujud, of becoming sort of one uh, with God. And Mani already has this down, you know, six centuries or four, four centuries before Islam. Okay, he already has this idea. By the way, he also claims to be the seal of prophets. So again, another idea that's already taking place in the third century. And so what Mani wants to do is to release you from this captivity of your bodies. And this is going to be happening at the end of time. And uh, someone is going to help you. And this person is going to come down and help you. His name is Jesus. Okay? Now this Jesus is a fighter. He is going to fight. He's not pacifist by any means. So very interesting. He, there is Jesus. So there is something that the Christians may have been attracted to. And it's not so far from uh, this idea of Christianity. The idea of giving gnosis or knowledge to you. Uh, but also the idea of releasing yourself from this captivity. That's very Buddhist and in some sense uh, Hindu. So you have this idea of moksha perhaps. And Mani we know travel to India. He was allowed to go there. So he probably had picked up that idea there as well. And then the idea of this dualism, where you're uh, spying between realm of darkness and light. Again, a Zoroastrian idea. Uh, so he's a very smart prophet. He's able to borrow ideas from each of these religions, make it quite understandable the way he explains it to people. And he is going to have a lot of followers, at least we're told. Uh, we find Manichaean texts in Egypt, in Coptic. Coptic is the language of uh, Egyptian Christians. Uh, and of course the idea revolves around gnosis or knowledge, and hence we get the idea of Gnosticism. That is, Mani is trying to, again, as I mentioned, give you knowledge, and he tells us in a very interesting story that Adam, when he was born in the beginning, so if there is an Adam, he was, uh, you know, deaf, he was uh, blind and dumb. He didn't know what was going on. Why am I here? And of course, uh, God is going to come down. And the name term for God that is used, the highest God in the Zoroastrian tradition is Zorvan, who is in the Zoroastrian tradition, in fact, is a deity associated with time, uh, is going to give him this gnosis or knowledge of, you know why you're here, because your soul has been entrapped, and it's going to be released at the end of time. That is basically Manichaeism. And Manichaeans are able to spread from uh, where the location is, this Mesopotamian region, where the Sasanian Empire is now, this is the post-Parthian period, all the way to the Tarim Basin to China. And we find a lot of texts also in the Turfan area. The largest number of texts probably are Manichaean. But they also move to Egypt. We find Manichaean Coptic texts. But they also move to Rome, and there's some evidence they came all the way to Britain. So this is the fast-moving religion of the third century. A couple of reasons why Manichaeans were so mm -hmm. successful is that the way the church was set up. You need organization. No matter how great your idea is, if you don't have organization, it won't take hold. And they do have the organization. Uh, Manichaeans, in general, are divided into two groups in antiquity, the elect and the hearers. The elect were the priests and the hearers were the followers. The elect uh, and the uh, hearers were both vegetarians, uh, but the priest never got married. Uh, having children was a sin, because why? You're entrapping more soul, right? More life particles and flesh. So that's a no-no. Uh, the hearers weren't that good yet, so they were practicing, and they were businessmen. Interestingly, a lot of these hearers tended to be businessmen who traveled throughout the Central Asia, went to China, went to uh, Egypt, and hence took their religious ideas with them, met people, and were converted. Here's a fragment of some sort of a um, ceremony or a feast of Manichaeans. This long white hat uh, suggests that they're Manichaeans, and there is a feast uh, going on. Uh, and so we find their organization in China, in Iran, Egypt, and Rome. And by the way, for those Iranians who love watermelon, there's this thing, I think, and probably other places as well. Mani also states that uh, watermelon is the best food. It releases the most light particles. <laughs> Just so you know, next time you're eating watermelon, uh, the Mani said so. Uh, 